Uh, just to take a couple more people first, um, what we'll get them to do is come in um, as they arrive um, and get them to sit right at the front. Uh, so we'll look at them, um, and I'm hoping that we can all give them some beady eyes to make them feel as incredibly uncomfortable as possible. Um, but uh, without further ado, my name is David Livermore, and I work for an organisation called Community Action Milton Keynes. Uh, and we are charged with um, our role within um, the MK Smart programme is to develop things that we call citizen labs. And that's where we can encourage as much discussion, um, debate, um, interest, um, infuse, motivate, encourage citizens of Milton Keynes to come together in order to address some of the challenges that we face as a city. Um, in as many innovative and collaborative ways as possible. Um, our organisation is uh, around, uh, based around community engagement. Um, we've been in Milton Keynes for about 30 years, uh, and I have the role uh, as Assistant Chief Executive. Um, so I'm very happy to be involved in the project, very happy to be here today. Um, my role will hopefully, after the initial two minutes, uh, sink away seamlessly into the background um, to encourage the rest of you um, to join our panel. Um, we're going to be hearing today um, from um, four different speakers. Uh, the purpose of the, the, the talks is really to stimulate the discussion. Um, we'll then move into the panel discussion uh, where we'll be joined by two other members. Um, and what I'm hoping from today, as you'll know, we're all very cosy, um, so I, I, want, I see this as, as rather than a, a broadcast panel a la question time, it's much more of a kind of interactive workshop between us all. So, um, I'm very happy that we're here today at the National Energy Foundation, uh, and we're joined by uh, Ian Burke, who's the Deputy Chief Executive here, and uh, Ian's just going to talk us through um, housekeeping, uh, plus also explain a little bit about the building. So, Ian, thank you. Thank you. Well, um, first of all, I know that quite a lot of you already know me and know the building, so I won't say too much about that, but I'd like to welcome you here again uh, on behalf of the Foundation. Uh, I was actually just amusing what the difference between an assistant chief executive and a deputy chief executive is. Um, it's it, it, it probably just the shape of the cross that we have to bear above us. Um, but anyway, um, on the housekeeping, the, the, the first thing to remember is of course that you're here so that you can understand it. Anyone who comes in late, you know, if the building burns down, they just have to stay and get burnt. Um, uh, you've seen obviously where the ex main exit is down the front, there's another one at the back. Um, toilets are sort of halfway down in the middle, um, there aren't very many of them, so the gents in particular, it's a bit of a race to get there first um, at, at, at any breaks that we have. Uh, if anyone needs any sort of water or additional stuff, there's the kitchen which you're able to wander into quite freely. Um, although I see we've got a few bits and pieces up the back. Um, that's really about it on, on, on the housekeeping side. On the building side, um, Probably the best way is if anyone wants a short guided tour at the end, I can give them a short guided tour and it will be short because it's a huge building. But all I will say is that this building was built just over 10 years ago now. It's amazing we've had to be in it 10 and a half years. Um, and it was an attempt to demonstrate what we could do on a reasonably low tech basis uh, to a reasonably tight budget and yet still come up with a reasonably interesting building. It's sort of a moderate in all, in all, in all respects. Um, so it's a relatively lightweight timber frame building uh, where you see uh, exposed timbers like this little one down there at the back and you can see up through the side. They are genuine timbers, they're not just sort of facing uh, a nice steel frame inside. They are um, supportive of the building. But we have a bit of thermal mass by having uh, brick walls at that end and at the far end as well, so the north, uh, the north and south. You can't see it today because we haven't got any sun at the moment. Um, but the sun would be at this stage just over there because that's roughly north. Uh, so the building is oriented east-west, although that, that's as much designed to fit on the um, shape of the plot. Uh, in order to be able to maximise use of things like natural daylight um, and uh, also the roof that's usable for PV, we have a slanted roof. So again, if you look up, you'll see that the roof is not quite the shape you might expect a normal roof to be. Um, and we have sun pipes coming through providing a bit of extra light. Um, we also have, and this will time perhaps something I'm saying when I get to my talk a little bit, uh, on that we um, try and use natural daylight and live with natural daylight as much as we can rather than having necessarily very high levels of artificial light. 
So there's no one going around the light meter saying, I've got to turn the lights on because of the fact that uh, it's perhaps a little bit duller than you might expect in a normal office. And that doesn't actually, we found, seem to affect productivity. Um, <coughs> and actually helps people feel a bit more in tune with what's going on around them. The building's heated by ground source heat pump through underfloor heating. Uh, and if anyone wants to see on the tour, you'll see how it's quite a big unit for quite a small building we need to do that. Um, the slanting roof means we have a little bit of photovoltaics on this roof, but we have rather more on the building next door because that's got a nice big flat roof and that took advantage of feeding houses weren't around when we built this one. We also have solar thermal. Um, we have a wood burning stove down at the front, which is probably hidden behind boxes at the moment, which is mainly for show. Um, so that if people come in on a cold day and they can see a nice wood burning stove, they can feel instantly warm, irrespective of whether it's actually pumping out any useful heat into the building. It's all mind games. A lot, lot of energy is about mind games. Um, and essentially that's that. There, it, there's, there's no gas in this building, um, so we're entirely dependent either on electricity or a little bit on wood pellets and, and a little bit of wood burning stove. Um, which means that obviously we have to sort of ride the ride of um, the overall carbon content of electricity in the UK. Uh, so when you go out to a spot, we have a display energy certificate um, by our front door uh, that says I think we're currently B rated. Um, so in terms of energy use, in terms of kilowatt hours per square meter, that's quite good for an office. Um, it, it certainly puts us in the top 5%. Um, in fact, I think they're probably slightly better than that. Um, that's about it. I really Thank you, Ian. Thank you, uh, Before we get into two presentations from Ian, uh, I'm going to wrap us up in terms of um, just talking about what is this all about. So, uh, MK Smart. So, MK Smart, um, um, some of you will know, some of you might not know, but MK Smart is a, a relatively new program in Milton Keynes. Um, it's a £16 million program which looks at how we can bring. Um, it's a significant collaboration program, so a range of different partners led by the Open University. Um, and its aim really is to identify innovative solutions to address the demand issues around energy, water and transport. As I said, in terms of the Citizen Labs, um, this is a programme of workshops that stretch over the next two and a half years. Um, this is the sixth um, in a series of workshops, um, and so far we've had over 100 different people, um, and particularly interesting, we've had 21 different project ideas that will emerge through this. Um, so that's particularly the exciting bit when we start thinking about what's going to be the action results that come out of something like today. Um, because what we do need to do, discussion's great, but we need to think about, well, what can we actually do? Action-oriented ideas. So today we're going to focus on energy, and in particular the role communities can play in how we can develop solutions to the challenges that we face as a city. And we've got a range of speakers who I'll just introduce in a minute, uh, and then we're going to host a panel discussion. Um, as I say, the purpose of today's Citizen Lab is to stimulate the discussion into how we can involve more communities into developing solutions for themselves. Um, we'll take some actions and recommendations from that, um, and then feed them potentially into a toolkit, uh, but also any project ideas that emerge. We are working alongside within this work package an organisation called Grey Matter, who are literally just over the road, um, who work around digital marketing, um, and they are developing a web-based collaboration platform. And what that will enable us to do by the end of the year um, is post all these ideas up and enable people right the way across the city to join in with those different ideas and and develop them into more than what they are at the moment. Um, so that will be very exciting. Um, final thing about social media, um, if anybody's got phones with them, um, we encourage you to keep them switched on, um, not to take calls, but if you want to tweet throughout today uh, about any of the discussion that's going on, um, what any of our panel members are wearing, um, all that is absolutely fine. Um, nobody <laughs> mentioned <laughs> Alan's sandals um, or waistcoat, uh, pictures will be taken later. Um, so, uh, let me introduce our first speaker, um, who is going to be Gerd. Um, Gerd Cortium, um, who many of you will know, is um, from the Open University uh, and has the um, wonderful opportunity to lead on not just this work package, um, but another one around energy as well. And I think Gerd also leads on education as well. Uh, so Gerd has a very demanding role. Um, 
which is why he looks so tired and uh, he's off on holiday next week. So let's not feel too guilty about him. Good. If you could uh, take over the floor. All right. Uh, so I don't know if we're gonna if we're gonna do that if I stand. Um, this is going to explain my uh, stance. <clears throat> Fortunately, Gerd is Professor of Computing, um, so I'm expecting this to go soon. He probably hasn't seen Windows I haven't, I, haven't seen, <laughs> I haven't seen Windows in a while, I stay away from Windows. Um, so, so I'm, I'm going to sit here, I hope that's okay. So, um, first of all, I, I, I'm I'm very glad that an event like this happens because I think we we uh, benefit all from having more discussions and identifying uh, common interests and expertise um, to shape uh, new project, new initiatives uh, for the future. Um, I have to admit that sitting here and being first talking about energy and community energy is I feel a little bit uh, strange because. I'm a technologist, I'm a computer scientist, I don't really know much about energy. Uh, but I'm trying to hide the fact uh, uh, normally. Um, and I have, I have been doing work in, in energy. So, but um, I'm, I'm looking at community energy from the point of view of a person working in IT and computer science. So you have to excuse my relatively narrow focus. Um, so therefore, my title, What Can Data Do for Community Energy? We're very much interested in data. So the big question, yesterday I was at a very interesting conference and the speaker asked this question, do people care actually about energy? And there are two very interesting questions. On the one hand, uh, on the one hand, that's, that's also an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we're going to have a problem with my presentation, and I'm not sure what we're going to do with it. I need help. I need to support <laughs> reopen. Switch off and switch back on again. <laughs> no, I'm doing a... Yes. Maybe you can open it directly from the memory. No, it might be this is an old version of um, Adobe on it. Let's just try that. So you haven't got the PowerPoint version. I, I do have the PowerPoint version. So to uh, perhaps I said I, I can pull out the PowerPoint. Realistically, it will take five minutes. Perhaps we can. Um, perhaps he will from take, we'll take another, another speaker speak first. So thank you, Gerd. Uh, <laughs> very short and sweet. Now those who know Gerd, that's the first time he has been short and sweet. Um, <laughs> We're going to move swiftly uh, over to Alan, who's coming on a little bit earlier than you thought we were Alan. Um, Alan Francis is a member of the Green Party and also a transport consultant. Um, and Alan, um, you can tell us a little bit about what you're talking about, and uh, over to you. Uh, right, thank you. Um, I've sort of been in Milton Keynes for over 35 years and have been involved in lots of sessions like this. Um, so I thought I'd try and sort of talk a little bit about kind of policies um, within the Kings, a bit about energy generation, a bit about um, sort of domestic and personal consumption, then a bit about transport, <coughs> try and cram all of that in. Um, Milton Keynes has a good history of energy innovations. There's home world, future world, and energy world, which those who've been around for a long time will remember. But we tend to be good at one off examples, not about reproducing it as a sort of systemic uh, way of, of um, doing low energy projects. Um, we're very good at having uh, community sessions like this and I sort of pulled out from my archive 
a copy of this, which one or two of you may, yes, Christine <laughs> recognises it. <laughs> so, yeah. so this was Milton Keynes' first a local agenda 21, which was we started work on 20 years ago. It was published in 1997, and again was a great sort of community um, involvement project. Um, and I was flicking through it, and sadly, you know, a lot of the things that we said need to happen in here have not happened. Um, Milton Keynes is it's good at publishing glossy brochures like this one, and Milton Keynes a sustainable future, a low carbon prospectus. But again, they're not always followed through. Um, I mean, one good thing that the council's done is what's called policy D4 in the local plan, which sounds a bit arcane. Um, but what it does insi is insist that new houses are built to a fairly good um, energy standard. And if they're not, the developer has to uh, pay into a carbon offset fund, about £200 per tonne of CO2. Um, and that money is then used to insulate um, and reduce the energy consumption of existing houses. That is a, a little bit sort of good thing. But I think the council needs to do a lot more to publicise its energy schemes. Well, I know we've got Jeremy here who, who works on this sort of stuff, but he's one person. The council needs to have a much bigger department doing this sort of thing. And the council needs to um, encourage behaviour change. It isn't going to happen on its own. We need to have a big um, publicity effort for these sort of things. One of the other things that I'd like to see the council doing is producing a carbon budget each year. Every year it produces a financial budget of what it's going to spend you know, our, as the taxpayers, money on. I think it ought to, as well as saying how much it's going to spend and how much it's going to get in in terms of fees and such like, it ought to produce a carbon budget for Milton Keynes to say where it thinks that the carbon um, is going to be emitted and, and how it can each year sort of um, reduce that. So that's just sort of an idea for perhaps later discussion. Um, energy generation side of things, I suspect I'm preaching to the converted here, uh, but we need lots more uh, renewables. Um, we need more wind turbines. And unfortunately, Milton Keynes Council has had a policy recently of opposing wind turbine farms. We have the one in Emberton that kind of got through, but any that have been proposed since then have been rejected because the previous administration of the council was um, very hostile to them. It came up with a policy of saying that um, there should be a separation distance of at least a kilometre between any dwellings and any wind turbines. And when you plot that on a map, it basically shows that there is only one place in Milton Keynes that you can put a wind farm, and it's where the existing one is. So it was a, a cunning way of saying <laughs> no more wind farms. Um, it eventually got challenged in court and thrown out, but it gives you an idea of the hostility that has been. Uh, we've had a change of administration recently. I don't know whether that's going to be a change of policy. Um, Photovoltaic solar panels, again, we need uh, lots uh, more of them. There are all sorts of schemes where you know you get all these cold calls now, people ringing you up saying, can I rent your roof <laughs> and put a solar panel on it if you own your house? But I had a, a question come through yesterday from somebody who isn't able to be here because there's no wheelchair access to this room. But the point, the point he wanted to raise, uh, and has asked me to sort of do it for him, is what about um, solar panels on social housing, because all those schemes are only really for owner occupiers. Um, you know, what about doing you know, council houses so that uh, and housing association so that their tenants can take advantage of um, the lower energy prices and so on. Um, combined heat and power. You know, we've got a nice scheme in Central Water Keynes, and that is providing heat to um, some of the buildings in the city centre. CBX is on it, I think parts of the hub, and I think the quadrant, the network rails near the quarter, is also um, connected to it. But, you know, can we do something like that on a more community based, say, where you have a school that has a combined heat and power station, but um, would also provide heat to some of the surrounding houses on the local estate. You know, there's lots of things like that where it could be rolled out um, more. Um, 
and a direct digestion. We've got a plant being constructed at the moment to take the compost waste from Milton Keynes that's collected uh, and get biogas from that, burn it, generate electricity, uh, and that's, that's uh, a good um, you know, alternative. It's renewable uh, uh, generation of electricity. Um, wave and tidal. And obviously, we can't really do much of that in Milton Keynes, but we do need a lot more of that in this country. It's been, you know, there's huge potential, fast coast, um, constant source of energy there, because people say criticise solar and wind, saying, oh, they're intermittent, which is obviously quite correct. But um, you know, wave and tidal power aren't. They are um, regular and predictable. Um, so we need to do a lot more of that. Um, we need a lot more kind of incentives for people to uh, install these uh, renewable systems. At the moment, they're a bit kind of hit and miss. A, a scheme is there for a couple of years, then it might disappear or change or something like that. It makes it really hard for people to predict in, in the longer term uh, how these things are going to work out and whether it's uh, worth, worth doing them. Um, on sort of um, domestic uh, buildings and the sort of personal um, use. We need to um, obviously encourage individuals and households to use less energy and to use energy that's come from more renewable sources. This is behaviour change. I'm not an expert on this. I think we might uh, sort of hear a bit more uh, that, about that. But we need big campaigns from councils, from governments and so on. You know, in the war, you know, you had these campaigns turn your lights out, you know, during blackouts and things like that. We need campaigns of that sort of uh, intensity to encourage people to uh, to use less energy. And again, that's sort of, you know, as individuals, we need to lobby councils and governments to run those sorts of campaigns. Um, we need smart houses, and I think one of my colleagues is going to talk more about this sort of smart grids idea, but I was talking to one of my uh, neighbours the other day who has now got a device whereby uh, from her mobile phone she can turn on a central heating on and off. Now, she likes warm uh, rooms to be very warm, so when she was out she used to leave her heating on the whole time so that the house was warm when she came back to it. That's incredibly inefficient, and she was saying how it's now reduced her energy bills because she can, you know, when she's out, go onto a mobile phone half an hour before she gets home and turn the heating on. It has the same effect, the house is warm when she gets back, but it hasn't been on for eight hours, it's been on for half an hour. need a lot more of that kind of thing so that people can um, you know, do the right thing and um, save energy. We need higher standards of insulation uh, on our buildings, not just the new build, but we really need to retrofit, refurbish a lot of uh, the old buildings. You know, I live in a building that's 150 years old, single skin brick walls. You know, it's not efficient, but it's very limited what you can do to those sorts of buildings. But uh, and there's, you know, despite all the new buildings and keys, there are a lot of old buildings as well. I so said we need lots more grants, advice, schemes, and so on. Um, on the sort of personal uh, issues, one way of encouraging people to reduce their personal consumption is personal carbon quotas, sometimes called domestic tradable quotas or tradable energy quotas. It goes by a lot of different names. But the basic idea is that everybody is allocated each year a certain quota of, let's say, tons of carbon emissions. And when you buy a service or a product that's got a lot of carbon either embedded in it or um, will, will be used to generate it, so that's maybe paying your gas bill, your electric bill, petrol for the car, that sort of thing, that as well as paying cash, you actually have to pay carbon, some of your carbon quota um, and everybody gets the same at so the beginning of the year. But some people will want to use more and some people will want to use less. And that's where the trading bit comes in because there is a trade, this is all the you know, computer networks and internet and all the rest of it, um, 
whereby the, so people can buy, who, who want more than those carbon quotas, can actually buy from the people who've used less. So that's a real incentive to, to use less, and, it, and it's sort of a penalty for the people who are using more, because they effectively are paying the people who are using less. Um, so what else have we got? Um, got a couple of minutes, Alan. Okay. Um, I'll go on to the transport stuff. Um, Lockheed is very car dependent. The campaign for better transport it's just done some surveys of similar sized towns, and Lockheed's come out as one of the worst for being car dependent. And of course, the cars are dependent on fossil fuel, and so um, sort of relatively high emissions. We have high car ownership. We've got 81% of households have got at least one car in Lockheed's, whereas in the UK it's 73%. Um, so we need to do things which will discourage the use of the car in Milton Keynes and enable people to uh, travel by more sustainable modes. So that means we need a massive modal shift to things like walking, cycling, buses, trains, trams, if we, if we uh, ever get them. Cycling, you know, we need to improve the redways. We need to make the roads safer for cyclists. Now, this is a hugely controversial issue, but cyclists should be allowed to use the grid roads, and the grid roads should be made sufficiently safe that they can uh, do so without you know, uh, expecting to be wiped off and <laughs> wiped out whilst doing so. Um, we need to massively improve the bus services. I came here by bus. The bus from the station didn't run. I'm going to have to wait for the next one, sort of 15 minutes. But even when the bus does run, it's a one kilometre walk from the nearest bus stop to this building. You know, now that's not good. What we need is a, a, a bus service that runs more frequently, more reliably, that goes to serves all the areas of Milton Keynes, not just the ones that you know happen to be lucky and kind of between. Wolverton city centre, Bletchley, there's lots of good services, but if you're off that route, it's, uh, it, it's pretty hit and miss. So we've got to make the alternatives to the car more desirable, but we're going to have to have, that's the carrots, there's going to have to be sticks as well, which means things like increasing car parking charges in central Milton Keynes, imposing the workplace parking levy, which the only city in the country that I think that's done it so far is Nottingham, where what it means is that car parking in places like uh, this, all the offices and the factories and so on around Milton Keynes, there is a levy upon car parking spaces. Nottingham we use it to fund the tram extension. You know, we need to be doing something like that in, in Milton Keynes. Um, and then we need to have green travel plans. That's the sort of thing that all of the uh, employers in Milton Keynes need to be doing. The council's got one. It encourages car sharing, and that's very successful. But you know, there are just an awful lot of things like that that need to be done in order to encourage that modal shift away from cars and into public transport um, and cycling and walking. Let's stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Uh, round of applause for Alan. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Ryan. And actually, it was incredibly helpful for you to um, kickstart uh, what we were talking about, um, particularly setting the tone in terms of policy. There's a lot of good intent, a lot of good ideas, but following that through in terms of resourcing and commitment is incredibly important. And noting that um, um, certain things will only get you part of the way, behaviour changes that will get you the rest of the way. Um, so, alluding to smart houses and technology retrofitting and carbon quotas, which sounded much like volunteer time banking actually. Um, so, I uh, really like the idea of developing that in the panel discussion. Um, but we're going to pass over, I think technology is now, we're going to give it another go at least. Uh, so, we're going to pass you over to Gerd. Um, I'm keeping a close eye on the time. Um, so, we'll, um, over to you, Gerd. Uh, thank you. So my, my second attempt, I, I also thought that it was actually much better that uh, you started rather than, than my, um, my uh, pushing my particular idea. So I started out, the, the question is, what can data do for community uh, uh, energy initiatives? So the first observation is that um, it's not quite clear to what extent people actually do care about energy because um, 70% of us have never changed tariffs, energy tariffs. 
to uh, switch to a lower tariff, a cheaper tariff. Um, that, of course, is not necessarily because people don't want to, but because it's so damn hard. Uh, the, the system is designed on purpose to be very hard for people. On the other hand, uh, there are a large number of community energy initiatives around the country, um, over 5,000. And so there is a huge potential bottom-up initiatives to uh, enact a dramatic shift in the energy landscape, which is growing, which is uh, being encouraged by the government. And I think uh, you might have seen the report that came out, published by the uh, government. So, um, it is supposedly the UK's first ever community energy strategy, where the government lays out its strategy for encouraging community energy initiatives. Um, it did a consulting exercise to understand what the state of community energy initiatives is out in the country, um, what the barriers are, what the challenges are, and supposedly the government is committing money to fund in the future community energy initiatives. Now, I haven't seen too many concrete plans in terms of the funding, so we'll have to see how that uh, 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 plays out. There's also some, certainly some skepticism to some, to, to what extent this is just uh, getting rid of the responsibility for actually doing much uh, about the current energy system and say, well, community are responsible for, it, for this now. Um, so it's quite interesting, but nevertheless, um, there is some so there are some interesting insights. Um, so the, the report identifies some interesting barriers and challenges for community energy initiatives, um, which I recognize and which at a conference yesterday of people who work in this field, uh, there was a broad consensus that these barriers and some of the insights in this report actually reflect uh, reality on the ground lack of awareness. People um, do not know what community energy is, um, that they could be part of it. Um, the skills and expertise in pulling something together um, and setting something up is very sparse. Um, having enough scale, how do you get enough people together to collectively undertake a, an effort initiative is very difficult. Quantifying the opportunities, where should we actually focus on, where should community groups uh, focus on and, and do something? Should it be on the generation side? Should it be on the demand side? Should it be on retrofitting? Um, and then once these initiatives have been done, uh, how do you measure savings and, and measure impact? All of these things are important barriers which we need to tackle. Now, MK Smart, I don't want to talk too much about this, um, but the focus is to some extent on data driven approaches to tackle uh, urban challenges in MK. Uh, and that, of course, that's, that's sort of my agenda. Data, I think, can play an important role for community energy initiatives. Um, Currently, uh, data doesn't play a, a huge role. Let me just briefly outline what we are doing in NK with respect to energy to, to help you understand um, what I mean by data in this context. Now, the vision of MK Smart is, to some extent, pulling together, I know you can read the, the text, but pulling together data from various sources um, existing open data um, uh, and generating new data uh, coming from households, coming from uh, the council and, and, and other sources, and to have uh, the facility to aggregate the data, to analyze the data, to make sense of the data, and to build in a way a model of MK on the transport or energy or water or other aspects. And so there is a big infrastructure being put in place to support that. 
Um, so I'm thinking of what data can do in this space in, in three steps. First of all, it can create new insights. It helps us understand what is going on. It helps us identify new opportunities and, and enables us to build new services. Uh, and I want to give you an example of what we have been doing so far. So we have been working with the satellite applications catapult in Oxford um, to acquire actually not satellite data, but uh, this, these kind of imagery uh, should be in the future coming from satellites. This was a new imagery taken from uh, planes, um, uh, newly commissioned. Um, and then figuring out to what extent we can automatically identify the current existing base of solar installations in Milton Keynes. Um, and so th the information which you see here indicated here's a solar installation, here's a solar installation, solar PV. This is still partly done uh, manually. We're looking at automating the process so that this can be done very rapidly so that we actually understand the spread of solar installations uh, very accurately in Milton Keynes or other places as well. Um, now, the, the, the imagery also gives us accurate 3D information of these buildings so we understand the orientation in 3D space of the roof so that we can accurately understand uh, the sun uh, light that hits the solar panels, which allows us, um, and that for, for all roofs uh, in, in Milton Keynes, that allows us to accurately understand what the whole solar potential in Milton Keynes is for every single uh, household. And that is data that is currently not readily available. So we're trying to turn that into a service um, so that any household can just say, well, what, using a particular technology, what would I gain? Um, you can commission surveys, of course, you can invite people to your home and you have to pay for these kind of things. Now, and that's where technology and data, I think, plays a can play a role uh, because we can turn that into a service on the web almost for free or for free depending on, on, on the model. Um, so we have been doing that, and we are uh, continuing to work on this 3D modeling, solar game, and, and all this stuff. Um, and we can turn this into the CO2 savings that we can realize potentially. Something completely different. Looking at households, what is going on within particular households. We, are, we have been working with Xeon and a large number of households in Milton Keynes to act to, to create a very accurate understanding of the energy practices in homes by monitoring uh, overall consumption, the generation using solar PV and fine-grained usage of appliances and light and these kind of things. Um, and so the first insight is an accurate measurement of the difference between generation and consumption. Here you see generation the green, consumption the red. Clearly, they're out of sync, not surprisingly. Uh, but we can actually measure that uh, for the first, well, not for the first time, but we, but we can measure that uh, accurately uh, depending on season and, and so on. Now, this is just the first level. What we have been doing then with households, we uh, reflected this information back to households to say, and this is all about using the washing machine, so a very narrow aspect of household uh, practices is uh, the instant of using the washing machine at this particular time, at 10 a.m. at a particular day, uh, resulted in roughly one quarter of it being powered by the solar PV and three quarters being powered by grid energy. Um, and that was an interesting insight for a lot of people because some, not all, but some households are developing social practices around trying to align their energy demand with maximum solar intake. 
Um, but it is very difficult for people to actually do that accurately. Um, and so we're trying to build on the emerging practices and to support the data to do that. Um, so this is, and then looking at if you shifted you, the, the use of the washing machine to a, the optimal time, what were, could the savings be? So this is sort of understanding your own practices. Now we turned that into a service by developing a prototype of a smart appliance, a smart washing machine that turns itself on depending on when the maximum actually is. And we've and, and, and we deployed this and, and that is working quite nicely. So this is sort of the what we can do and what we are trying to do. Now there is a lot of data out there around energy, open data, from the government, from other sources, um, about consumption, average energy consumption by dwelling type, property age, flow area. So a lot of aggregated data, um, which is potentially useful, uh, but it's sparse, it's not necessarily integrated with other data. Uh, food poverty, display energy certificates. So there's lots of information. What we're trying to build now is an infrastructure um, something which we call an energy map for Milton Keynes that pulls together these various sources, the new sources which we develop from satellite imagery, uh, sensor data from household, existing open data, so that we can make a sense of this data, um, so that the data uh, becomes useful for future initiatives. Two minutes ago. Yes. So coming back to my data, what can, uh, what can data or MQ Smart do for community energy? For me, community energy is all about collective action, people coming together. Now, this example has nothing to do with energy, well, not directly. So there have been some interesting studies on what's the potential of ride-sharing in a city um, by looking at actual traces of how people drive with their cars uh, and looking at, well, if you just want to wait for a maximum of 10 minutes for a ride and you only want to walk 100 meter to catch a ride uh, in any case. So the potential is we could take away 50% of the traffic in, in cities and these are particular cities that, that comes from just by fully using the potential of ride sharing. Now there are social constraints. Uh, but that's sort of the maximum uh, that could be achieved. Now I think similar things could be done around energy. So I think when it comes to data and community energy, data plays an important role. Um, Community-wide data collection to quantify opportunities, what really is the savings potential? Where are, the, where are really the, the big opportunities where we should focusing on? Should it be in a particular, so if we look at, let's say there's a group of 20 households, they come together and say, well, if we all used solar generation and we tried to sell our own electricity or try to get a better deal, what would the numbers actually be? Rather than sort of nobody knowing exactly and then so being able to make these trade-off decisions. Um, so, and quantifying the impact of community initiatives and being to compare between different alternatives and between different communities, uh, that's, I think, at least one of the big barriers which data can take away. Thank you, Gerd. More work with Gerd, please. Uh, it was incredibly uh, helpful, Gerd. And I think uh, some of the things really enlightening stat right at the beginning that 70% of us haven't even changed our tariff. Uh, and yet there are 5,000 community groups already established right the way across um, the UK. So, you know quite disparate information. The fact that we've now uh, developed a national community energy strategy, given Alan's presentation slightly earlier, it'll be interesting to see how policy can transform into action, which is some of the issues that we have in the Keynes. Um, and then around data and how MK Smart Program is bringing those disparate data streams together in order to provide those kind of specific insights that we can use on an individual level, washing machine scenario, as well as then on a whole community and then a city-wide example. So the opportunity then to bring those out into the panel discussion can be really exciting about how we use those different streams. So 
I'm going to now pass over to Gary. Uh, and Gary is a smart, smart grid, smart city grid consultant, um, and um, also works on a low carbon initiative. We're working with WPD on one of the largest LCNF projects. And Gary's going to introduce himself much better than I did. Introduce yourself. Thank you, Gary. Good morning, all. Thank you very much. I'm uh, not an engineer. I always like trying to get in first. Uh, because there's a, a bit of an assumption, especially through working with the likes of Western Power Distribution, that we have a, an engineering approach. Uh, Smart Grid Consultancy is very much aimed at looking at the sort of commercial side of, of the network. There's lots of uh, new concepts and good ideas out there, but they don't always necessarily fit, fit in at a, a financial or practical uh, aspect. Uh, and to that end, I also uh, was asked to come along and speak about the community today. Uh, I want to take a slightly different uh, angle on it from uh, oh, we can hardly see the words of the text has all changed there. Uh, uh, again, IT issues with the changing machines. So, uh, first of all, I wanted to look at uh, what is a community? Because uh, a community, the, the definition in the Oxford Dictionary, if I can still read it there, a group of people living in the same place or having a particular characteristic in common. So, when we talk about communities, I think people have that image of the, the village green or the, uh, the, the, the village hall and, and the community coming together. Uh, uh, maybe even a, a, wee, a wee spot of modest dancing there. Uh, but if we then go to the, looking at community in the context of energy, uh, I, I struggled to find a, a clear definition of that and I actually went on to the, uh, the www.gov site and actually from the, the same location as from Gerd's report is, and this is going to be even tougher to read. But, Community energy covers aspects of collective action to reduce, purchase, manage, and generate energy. Community energy have an emphasis on local engagement, local leadership, and control, and the local community benefiting. Collectively from the outcomes, community-led action can often tackle challenging issues around energy with community groups well-placed to understand their local areas and bring people together with common purpose. Now, as you can see, I've highlighted the word local there. It's probably the only word you can see. Because actually, that's the thing that I really want to challenge in terms of when you're talking about community energy. I think the local bit is actually a bit of a, a misnomer. It's, uh, it's not a, it doesn't have to be as uh, a huddled round on the village green or indeed huddled round a, uh, solar panels and, and a, a big wind turbine. Uh, I was more focused on the first piece that they were talking about within the community definition on, on the Oxford Dictionary, which is characteristics individuals have in common and potentially that's a far more sensible way to start thinking about communities when you're talking about energy because realistically energy is relatively non-geographic we have a, a system uh, at the moment which is designed around the, the centralized principle of you have large power stations located hopefully away from the the conurbations because they spew out fumes and uh, and they, they have need good transport links to get the fuels in there. Uh, you then have a, a system operator, National Grid, who sit away somewhere in distance, making sure everything runs. The energy trading happens in, in the big suppliers' uh, uh, the back offices, and, and really the first you get visibility of it is the, is the retail side, and that can often be the, the cold collar or, or one of the things that's, uh, that's, that's really quite distasteful about the energy industry. Then from, from an actual physical perspective, electricity, flows downhill, I tend to think of it more akin to, to water, uh, uh, gravity fed, it, it comes through the transmission system, down through distribution and metering, and ultimately, the consumers at the end, but largely at the moment, very, very independently, we don't ask permission when we go switch on the light or switch on the TV, boil the kettle, we just have this assumption that, it, that it's there. Uh, so, that is, that is true even when you look at a community, if you go to a village or a town, you have a huge cross-section of people all behaving differently. Potentially the only thing they have in common is the fact that they all live in the same location. Whereas, from a community perspective, it's maybe worth thinking of energy markets more around grouping people around their lifestyle and interests. The, one of the ones I think is, is possibly most interesting from a commercial perspective is the behaviour you see from people who are involved with loyalty programmes. Tesco's, Shell, Air Miles, people drive straight past a filling station, 
off to one a couple of miles further down the road because we're going to get air miles or nectar points. And, uh, uh, or indeed, it's uh, a community could be said to be the same of people who are in the same type of employment because they have similar behavioural characteristics. They leave for work at the same time, they turn at the same time, potentially have roughly the same income, so possibly doing the, the, the same part times. <coughs> Online groups. My goodness, some of the biggest communities we see are through things like <laughs> Facebook and, uh, and uh, LinkedIn. And then you could simply go down to say, let's look at the way people use energy and try and make a community based around behaviour in, in that respect. Now, and this, this kind of touches uh, quite nicely back as a segue to, to what uh, uh, Gerd was saying. The technology is actually there. You don't have to go out and create anything new. It's, it's probably more market principles that, that, that uh, make you actually able to create uh, communities uh, through, through different structures other than where people live. But the technology absolutely exists. So uh, the, the reading of this is, I think, is going to put everyone in, in, in a bit of strain there with it. Uh, it's not particularly clear, so I'm, I'm probably going to go a wee bit uh, off on, on a, a, a kind of free flow here. Uh, potentially by smartening the home uh, and, and changing the way we, we consider energy, we can actually create communities which people potentially don't even know they're part of. Uh, the, the kind of at the heart of it is, is just putting that a little bit of extra intelligence into the home. Most, if not all, you said probably I would imagine everyone who's here today has got broadband at home and they've got their Wi-Fi return. Uh, certainly it's, it's penetration to, to the UK as a whole is, is massive. But that can be taken a, a, a stage further. Instead of, uh, I'm, I'm not a great fan of smart meters, I think they're, they're a technology that's out of date before we've even started with them, uh, but uh, that's maybe not the, uh, the, the best subject matter for today. Uh, but in essence, we live a large portion of our lifestyle online, and that can be seen through things like the success of Amazon and the, uh, and the fact that the, through the data that's available, they start to try and understand you and they, and they go, well, you looked at this, or maybe you like some of this, or you bought that, and most people who bought that also wanted some of this, and starting to, to use algorithms and, and various things to understand people and, and bring them together. Now, the technology is absolutely uh, available there at the moment, where we have plugs that can be controlled via the Wi-Fi network, uh, and I'm sure we're all familiar with, with uh, web portals. The, the kind of suggested vision for, for creating communities around energy is when you switch on your computer, you would have a, a portal come up, and on the left-hand side, the breakdown of all your own data in terms of how you use electricity, and that can get quite detailed particularly where you have these advanced plugs looking at specific devices that you're using and that will extend out as we see electric vehicles and potentially solar panels uh, penetration increasing. But more importantly, through that same PC, through that same router, we do our weekly shopping, we do our Amazon browsing, we're on eBay, it starts to give an opportunity to get a very clear insight as to how people behave. So the, the, the kind of potential vision there is, is you can for example, if you're taking it purely on energy consumption, and you can measure people on, on energy consumption, then you can have a whole list of suppliers, and it looks at how you're consuming, and says, okay, you, if, if all you're interested in is pounds per kilowatt, then I understand how you behave, I understand how you use electricity. Here, here are your five best tariffs, and you can look at that over. Monthly, weekly, annual period, uh, and ultimately the recommendations are there, but more importantly, it could establish what communities are more suitable to you. And it also helps align incentives, because if it understands a bit about you, it can move you away from that pounds per kilowatt dialogue. So, for example, you are a Sky user, and uh, you know, basically, uh, instead of trying to offer you a very small reduction, because let's be honest, with so many, much of the cost being based around the annualised costs, the ability to significantly reduce your, your bills in a pounds per kilowatt basis is quite limited. You know, if you're paying 11 pence for your, your electricity per kilowatt and the majority of your loads you need to do, you need to cook, you need to heat, the majority of that's there. But if you encourage people to change their behaviour and align the centre, incentive, so I do a lot of work in demand response, don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but it's effectively offering a payment to a business and saying, if you can uh, 
operate on your own generation during this peak period, or if you can reduce your consumption, we will pay you X. Now, for a large commercial business, you can actually make reasonable sized incentives. But when you break that down to the kind of level of, of flexible loans that you hold within a home, realistically, if you're asking people to, to not consume around peak periods in winter, you can maybe get up to a total of 10 to 12 pounds per annum saving that you, that you can offer them. It's not a huge incentive. However, if you say to that Sky user, if you take part in that event, I will give you a pay-per-view movie. Realistically, if you give the money to Sky, they can do that. But it, it aligns those, those incentives far more clearly. And I'll just use Sky as an example. It might be that the community you're identified with is a charity that you're organised with and feel strongly about. It could be your Tesla's club card. It could be a whole host of, of, of different things. But ultimately, the understanding actually starts identifying communities for you that are more appropriate and completely non-geographic. It also goes to the other extent that if you start pulling communities together, the feed-in tariffs aren't ideal. They, they, they are, you're, to get the best value out of them, you want to be consuming the electricity that's coming out of your solar panels. If you're a working individual, you'll probably work all day while the solar panels are operating. However, if you move that settlement point of the feed-in tariff not to the individual house, but to the community that they're part of, then you can actually mix that community to, to have the solar benefit being shared with someone 50 miles away, 100 miles away. It doesn't really matter. That's just market structure that can be altered in the background. And then as we add in all these other additional things like vehicles, which are basically big mobile batteries, uh, or you've, you've got the, 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 the solar, you can actually start making some people with solar panels potentially over on the west coast charging the vehicles over the east coast because it's, it's really the, the electricity that, that's generated you actually see it's just settled within, within the markets uh, so uh, essentially that was just a, a, a wee summing up I don't know how that works on, on the, the time but I would like to actually throw it for, for any comments or questions if, if anyone has any couple of minutes, but what I'd like to do is say questions for the panel discussion. Okay, in that case I'm going to throw in one last week, but the, the, the kind of basis of the justification of actually looking at this was something that I became very uncomfortable with in my, uh, my, my last company. I uh, was one of the founders of the first demand response company in, in the UK, and that was very much about turning down demand when there was a, a, a lack of electricity. But uh, about three, four years ago, National Grid said, would like you to provide the opposite of that, essentially what, what's regarded as a footroom service. On more and more occasions, there are situations where solar panels, large wind farms are now generating more electricity than there's demand for in the UK. And the, the, uh, there was, a, again, Telegraph's quite, uh, quite good on it, a bit of a scandal uh, uh, a few weeks ago, where they announced that £60 million last year was spent paying wind farms to turn off because they were providing electricity into the system when there wasn't demand to use it up. Uh, and National Grid's view was, can you go in, in the same way you, uh, I, I used to get lots of small generators together or, or people to turn down load and effectively create a virtual power station model, is can you actually go get a groups of people together or probably businesses who would be willing to consume electricity and will pay you to do that? And it just felt deeply unethical that, <laughs> that National Grid would pay me money to then share out to organisations whose buildings would take control of, but potentially switch lighting on to make the pain of that electricity go away. When we potentially have people in energy poverty, but how do you identify those people in energy poverty? How do you communicate that to them? How do you control them? How do you push the electricity out of them? Using the exact same principles of everything that's in there, if the community you have there has people identified as, as in energy poverty, then it's far more equitable that when there's an excess of electricity, instead of paying a business to switch on its lights to use that, is if we have the, the comms and the structure to actually push that electricity out and give it away for free, then surely that's a win-win for everyone because national goods getting the service they want, we're maintaining the, 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 the improved green mix of the energy by keeping the wind farms on, and those who actually need the energy get given it for free. Anyway, I'd like to end on that one. Wonderful ice bags. Wonderful. Thank you, Gary. Um.
incredibly helpful. Um, community, local or not, um, defining communities as having common characteristics. Uh, that's the idea about the introduction of smart grids and their commonality about the different speakers, um, particularly around um, incentivizing. So this, um, how we motivate this change, behavior change that Alan was talking about. So leads to a, a common community, but also how might we address some of the different motivational factors that are going to influence me to change my behavior. Um, and to finish on the virtual power station is frankly brilliant. Um, so I uh, love that idea, uh, it's all caught on camera. Um, so we've got one speaker left, Ian, it's over to you. Uh, and the entire time, because we're slightly running over. Um, but um, I'll be as quick as I can in that case. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Um, we were asked initially to look at ways in which um, Milton Keynes individuals and communities sort of might be able to uh, implement innovative energy solutions to address the challenges we face in the city. So like everyone else, I'm going to slightly ignore the answer, but anyway. And I was actually thinking, what's my vision? What would be the vision for Milton Keynes and energy consumers, because we're all energy consumers, within the city? But perhaps at some point in the future, not necessarily very short term, but you know, where would we like to be? You know, 2050 is a nice convenient day if everyone uses 2050 quite a lot. And I think one of the things I came up with was actually a surprising one, particularly in the context of some of the presentations we've had, uh, with all due respect, particularly to Gert, and that is that we probably only need to use technology when we benefit from it. And we don't just go around trying to find a technological quick fix for all the problems. Um, so for a start, I'm actually living the, the story here by not having a PowerPoint. And to dispense with that and get that bit of technology out of the way. Um, in my case, anyway, PowerPoint only really a comfort blanket. It's got something that I can hang myself onto, and, and, and um, you know, it, 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 it's just as well to try and work from notes. But if I apologise, if I then sort of appear to be sort of a little bit nose down, I'll try, I'll try and remember not to read this and look at you guys as well. So that's the first thought. But actually, that isn't necessarily really saying we must dispense with technology. It's certainly not saying let's go back to um, nature and all grow beards and wear sandals. Sorry, good. You're one out here. Um, it's it's perhaps rather more about empowering people, about making sure that they feel in control of their own energy, um, and that they feel that they have a responsibility for what they're doing. Now that might be difficult when, again, as Gert pointed out, a lot of people actually don't appear very interested in energy and would much rather sort of go and you know, watch the latest thing on YouTube than sort of muck, muck around and try and control. Um, whether they've got their heat <coughs> on or not. And we have to balance that because we're never going to get everyone really enthusiastic. But what I'm perhaps trying to avoid is less uncontrollable energy. To take a very simple example I heard about the other day, um, there was a lady in social housing, she was not very tall, she was probably about 75, 80, and she had a bathroom which, like so many bathrooms these days, has uh, an extract fan, so you put the light on, along goes the extract fan. Um, put the light on, probably off at the end, it probably runs for another 10 minutes or so. Um, and obviously this was annoying her. And like a lot of these extract fans, it was up there somewhere, and there was a switch up there somewhere that you could actually override it beside the fan. Um, and the housing association whose property she was would go back and would regularly support speak to her and say, it's everything okay, it's house fine, she's fine. And then say, oh, well, your fans switched off, shall we switch on again for you? And she said, oh, yes, yes, please. She said, I had some people came in, but they, they, they were doing things and they, they switched it off. So, yes, you put it back on again. And after this has happened two or three times, they realised actually, because there were no people coming in and switching off the fan for her, she was switching it off because she didn't want it, she didn't like the sound of the fan, she thought it was using lots of electricity or whatever it might be. Uh, and so she was sort of balancing herself on tops of chairs and whatever, and sort of dragging them in from the room next door, because obviously it's a bathroom, you don't have a chair in the bathroom, and, and, and climbing up and switching it off. But she wasn't going to admit that to anyone, because A, they'd probably immediately sort of start telling her off for sort of breaking health and safety or whatever by doing so. But also she didn't really want to admit that she was overriding the technology that someone had decided was good for her bathroom. Good for her. Um, and that's the sort of issue we find actually coming quite a lot. The other problem we find um, is that people are issued with nice central heating systems with nice sets of controls, and they're so damn complicated. The only way you can possibly do it, if you haven't got a PhD in central heating controls, not many of us have, 
is actually to get the manual out every time, flip through the manual, which is probably written in German, translated into English not terribly well, or else it's sort of done by lots of IKEA-style pictures. You've got to try and sort of work out what, what pictogram means. And is, that, is that person really sort of trying to stab the, uh, the unit when he actually does pressing a button? Um, and that can also be a problem. And so although you may be able, in theory, to override the technology, in practice, a lot of times you'll find it very hard to do so. So there's a lesson about keeping it simple. But over and beyond that, also, if people are actually to do this and to use these systems, they have to understand a little bit more about energy. We have to improve the energy literacy of the UK. And that is something that's beginning to be understood, that a lot of the time, people don't know much about energy. When you ask them a question about energy, they'll say, yeah, I know a bit about this. But they perhaps know about it from when they did GCSE physics or something like that. Or they've got some vague picture of the fact that, yeah, we know all about energy. You know, most of our electricity comes from oil fired power stations or nuclear power stations or whatever. In fact, that less than 1% comes from oil fired power stations. No one seems to realise these days. People have a lot of misconceptions, so we need to help. It's not helped also by the fact that we can't decide what our unit of energy is. I mean, if you go to the System International or ISO, they'll tell you it's the joule. But you don't have to see joules very often. And it's such a tiny unit of energy, you can't do anything with a joule. So if you look around at what's actually banded around, maybe on bills or in newspapers or on TV reports, you know, energy can be in gigajoules, it can be in kilowatt hours, it can be tons of oil equivalents, it can be in kilocalories, it can be in quadrillions if you live over the other side of the Atlantic. I love this sort of quadrillions. That lovely unit name, it, 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 it's actually a billion, billion British thermal units. But that's what Americans talk in terms of. <laughs> Don't ask me why they still use the BTU, but they do. It can be in thermals, well, not so often in these days. It can be tons of TNT. You know, there's a whole load of things. And in actual fact, that when you start trying to sit and say, well, you know, sort of, even the simple things like, you know, how much energy is there in a Mars bar? I forgot to bring it up. I've, I've got a demonstration Mars bar, because I don't have to line up very much. So I just carry one round it every now and then. How much energy is there in a Mars bar? I mean, you might be able to tell me how many calories there are. How many kilowatt hours are there in a Mars bar? Well, in actual, a typical Mars bar's got the equivalent of about a third of a kilowatt hour of energy inside it. So when you go switch on a light and think, how many kilowatt hours am I using, or how many kilowatts am I using, and how many kilowatt hours am I using over a period of time, then it's worth bearing in mind a third of a Mars bar, or sorry, sorry, three Mars bars, rather, to so stick them end to end, you know, and, 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 and to try and translate it. You know, one of the most common units of energy consumption that people understand is miles per gallon. Absolutely great because of the fact we sell it in litres, so people you know, probably don't really have a way of doing it too well to know that. Anyway, miles, miles per gallon. People might better tell you that, but if you ask people about, well, okay, how much energy have you got in that gallon of petrol versus how much energy you need to run your house for a while, or how many kilowatt hours on your electricity bill or gas bill, then frankly, no one's got a clue. Even I have to go through and sort of start getting my calculator out and do some scratching with my head and trying to remember to get them. Not, not to get things out by a factor of a thousand, because when they talk about kilowatt hours and kilojoules and kilolitres and kilowatts. So it's a difficult one. So that's the first point I want to make about we've got to empower people, but we've got to give people a little bit more understanding. Because otherwise, behaviour change is very important. People might end up doing the wrong behaviours, wrong in inverted commas, of course, um, in order to do that. <coughs> Linked into that is this whole concept of energy hierarchy. This sense that if we want to overall improve our use of energy or reduce the amount of carbon emissions or whatever. It's actually best approached by way of a hierarchy. And the first one is just to avoid waste. To actually stop using energy when we don't need to. And, and I've got thought, comments there, Gary, on sort of people being sort of encouraged to use energy at all times of the day is a, a, a fascinating. Maybe if they all had electric cars parked outside, well, we have got one here, I forgot to mention that earlier. Then, then, and then we can persuade them just to charge the electric car when we've got spare energy, that would be useful. And that does need probably good technology to do that. Secondly, in the hierarchy, is to actually use the energy more efficiently. And I think, I personally think it's actually quite important we try and keep that in mind before we move too much to the third one, which is to generate it from renewable sources. Because otherwise, there ain't going to be enough renewable sources to go around if we're still using it profitably. So we have to try and get that in order. That's not to say we shouldn't use renewables, and we shouldn't introduce renewables. But before we can be on a wholly renewably based system, I think we've got to cut that demand first and use it more efficiently. 
And only finally at the bottom stage of the hierarchy is to go where and use anything else you've got to go and use as cleanly as possible. Going back to the original question, the second bit of it was about innovative. And this is about, I get slightly concerned about innovation for innovation's sake. A lot of the time we know what the solutions are. It's not particularly high tech. It's getting people to use the existing solutions rather than to be wholly innovative. Yes, we can be a bit more innovative about the way we give them information. And although I said at the start I wasn't keen on using technology, I'm actually very happy to use technology to give people the information so that they can then be empowered to make the decision. Um, and the question there is how much is that happening at an individual level and how much can we do it at the community? Um, and again, a bit like Gary, I'm a bit concerned that community is not necessarily the right unit. You probably need, in order to balance energy demand and supply well in the UK on a time basis, you probably need a certain degree of domestic and non-domestic. Uh, that makes life an awful lot easier. But the trouble is, people's concept of a community is usually purely domestic. I don't quite know how we get over that unless we all go start going working at home, um, you know, sort of or having little blacksmith shops or whatever it might be. So that, that's an issue. The other thing there is also in terms of encouraging um, in <coughs> innovation and investment in energy, a lot of the time I agree with you it's communities of interest. Um, and for example, one of the, the best examples around is the uh, series of Baywind cooperatives, or cooperatives fostered by Baywind originally, um, in terms of community owned uh, renewable energy generation. But let's be quite frank, most of the time they're not really local communities. There is a core of each one in a local community, but there are a lot of people like myself who are hangers on from outside the local community who are involved with it. So, for example, I don't have a great deal of connection to the Barrow and Furnace. Like, I think I've been there once in my life. Um, but I'm still part of a community energy scheme in Barrow and Furnace for that very reason. So, that's another thing to bear in mind, and it, it, it's important to, to look at communities in both senses. And on that context as well, we have to remember that even when we have a good geographical community, people may not agree about what the right thing to do is. I um, don't think we've had too much of a problem in Milton Keynes, although there's always been a nimbyism whenever people start talking about <coughs> wind turbines. A classic example of that, which I will keep the town anonymous, but some of you may be able to guess which one it is, is one of the leading towns in the transition movement, which has transition town X, and everyone says, this is brilliant, everyone knows this one. Well, about three or four years ago, we in the foundation were working with an offshoot of transition town X, which was the X Renewable Energy Society. And the ex-renewable energy society felt we've had a lot of nice talk in the transition town movement about this. Let's go and do something. And so they went and they commissioned a bit of a survey. They said, you know, where are we? What have we got? Have we, can we use hydro? Well, there's a few rivers, but there's not much run river option. And there's certainly nowhere we can do big hydro. Can we do biomass? Well, that's fine. If we're doing biomass, we'd probably be importing it from sort of forests in the south of the USA, just like Prax does. You know, can we do solar? It's a bit we can do on solar, but that's before the theme tariffs were around so that the economics weren't quite good. What can we do? Oh, we're actually not far from the coast, we've got some nice wind blowing through, let's go and put some wind turbines up. And at that point, suddenly, there was a horrible schism within the movement because some of the people in the transition town said, oh no, no, we can't possibly have those wind turbines. You know, we've been looking at that particular hill for the last, goodness knows how many hundred years, and something wind turbine up there, and it's horrible as there's one up there now. And in the end, the, the, the nimbyists managed to destroy the uh, plans of the Renewable Energy Society, and so there are still no wind turbines on that field there. And I think we have to remember that communities are not necessarily quite as nice, coherent bodies as we might imagine. I mean, after all, I don't think the archers would have been running the radio serial for 60 years. It was all peace and light in that particular fictional community. <laughs> so that's my sort of final point on that one. I just want to come back one more again about this, this whole point about whether people actually are interested in energy. I, I, and whether the fact that 30% of people only have switched suppliers indicates they're interested in energy. I, I think actually that probably indicates two things. Firstly, maybe if they're really interested in energy, they understand it doesn't actually really matter too much who you buy a supply from. You're going to get the same stuff out of the national grid anyway. Uh, and even if you buy a certified green supply, which I would recommend, um, there's still only a marginal uh, degree of additional renewable energy coming on stream as a result of that. It's very marginal, and most of the electricity you buy is still 
going to be brown one way or another. Or sort of shine in the dark, I guess, it's neutral. Okay, anyway, <laughs> glowing in the dark. Um, so that's the first thing. So maybe if people do understand about it, they wouldn't bother switching because they'd know it's a bit of a zero sum game. And secondly, the real reason for switching is because they're interested in money, not because they're interested in energy. Because they, there is a apparent opportunity, an apparent opportunity to save money by doing so. But in fact, of course, I think people are also probably a little bit cynical about the whole thing and that they now realise that they might be on a better deal next week if they switch today, but the week after they're probably going to be then paying for it. Um, and that it's not going to be a long-term gain. So I wouldn't be too disheartened by that statistic. It, it is one that the government and often love to bandy about to say, oh, it's terrible, all these people haven't switched yet. But actually, it might be that the people out there are the downside brighter than often the government are giving them credit for being. Uh, and then they know there's not really that much benefit from, from doing the switch. So, well, that, that's roughly all I have to say before I run out of my virtual PowerPoint down here. Um, good to have my Wonderful. Thank you, Andrew. It was um, great to hear about um, needing to develop a vision, um, and that's perhaps something that we'll touch on in the panel discussion, uh, particularly when the, the, the vision um, doesn't include us all having to grow beards or wear sandals, um, which I take to heart. Um, the importance of keeping things simple, um, you know, the use of data in bringing together terms and quantities, use of technology in sharing information to enable change. I think, again, you know, starting to touch upon what other panel members have talked about. Um, what I'd like to do now um, is, um, from myself, collectively thank uh, the speakers, um, but also introduce uh, Jeremy Draper uh, from Milton Keynes Council and, and Fashid Krishna Murphy uh, from the Open University, who's a lecturer on energy, um, who will just be um, joining. As I say, it's a very close knit group, so I, I see it as an extended panel, uh, but um, the pressure's kind of off this side of the room onto this side of the room as we direct the, the questions and encourage that conversation. Um, so just before um, we want to take a break, I thought it would be good just to uh, kick start some of this. Um, and I'm sure everybody's got some questions and want to get involved um, as quickly as possible. Um, and in terms of just setting out some of the um, parameters for how we're going to manage this, um, we just want to make sure that we can understand any questions that emerge either from myself uh, or from the group. Um, so I might, um, if questions come to me first, and then I will hopefully clarify that and then project that to um, panel members. If it's direct to a panel member, let me know and then I can make sure that happens. Um, otherwise, I'll just pick one at random whoever's not looking at me at that particular moment in time. Um, Best intentions are always assumed. Um, I will um, direct the initial question, but then we want to get into more of a discussion. So we'll kind of let that flow, um, and I'll keep an eye on time, um, because I've got a structure in mind that I want to take us through to, um, from um, just looking at the kind of vision and the kind of landscape that we're in at the moment, the kind of uh, behaviour changes that we might want to see, uh, what kind of policy and structural landscapes that we might need to make in order to make that happen. Um, and then to end around individual actions that we can all take. So I kind of wanted to run in that, that kind of theme, but um, you know, let's, let, let's start where we are. Um, we uh, just heard from everybody here, and it would be great if people have got some initial observations that they just want to perhaps clarify um, with some of the people here before we then get into um, a kind of structured conversation. So, sign 